want some? Wait, I have something to show you guys. This is the snow globe that plays music. Yeah. This one. Now it's broken. Oh. Okay. Hi, my name is Nora. I have a little story for you. And once upon a time, there is a girl named Mary and a boy named Joseph. And Mary and Joseph couldn't find any place to live. And Joseph was paying money for the government, and they found no hotel, so they had to go in a barn with lots of sheep and lots of animals, and there was peeing poop everywhere. And then Mary said, oh man, why did you buy that barn? And then all the all the sheep came because they wanted to have a nice place to stay. But they yelled and they yelled, but baby Jesus was born. And then the and then the angels came and and they got to and they got to see the baby and they said, wise man, come here, look at that beautiful baby. And the wise man came and they saw that beautiful baby that was so precious and they gave him presents. And all, and all the people came and that's why this whole story is about birth. And, the, and then that's the end of the story, bye. That's exactly how it happened mostly, right? <laughs> mostly exactly how it happened. Uh, today we're going to just hear four different stories uh, from four different people. And all this Christmas season, those that are part of Shoreline, what we've been doing this Christmas season is we've been coming to this manger, coming to see Jesus, but we've kind of looked at the story through different people's eyes. So we, we asked, you know, if, if, when the shepherds came, what did they see? What did they experience? And we kind of watched Christmas through their eyes, a very unique perspective. Then the wise men. Traveled 900 to 1,000 miles around the desert. Probably took four to five months to get there and get back. And amazing. And they came and experienced Jesus led by a star. They tell their story. We can learn that from the word of God. And then we looked at it from Mary's perspective. And Joseph, even though Joseph wasn't really Jesus' father, he, he was betrothed to Mary, but he had a perspective, a close-up perspective on what happened. So we kind of looked through his eyes. We looked through the eyes of God the Father. Last night we thought of God the Father looking because God is truly the father of Jesus and the father of all of us who come to him by faith in Jesus. We look through the eyes of John the Baptist, who was one of the first people to meet Jesus. John the Baptist was still in his mother's womb. Jesus was still in his mother's womb. The moms met and the babies went, hey, how you doing? That's a paraphrase, but John the Baptist jumped and leapt in his mother's womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Amazing. Today we're going to look through the eyes of people who weren't there that first Christmas. The first one we're going to look through is the eyes of a guy named Saul. Saul actually didn't believe in Jesus. We meet Saul after Jesus lived his life, after Jesus died on the cross, after Jesus rose again, and Saul was trying to destroy Christians and destroy the church. He was against Jesus. But then he had an experience. His Christmas experience, he encountered Jesus. And what he did was over and over and over, he told that story. Every chance he got. He talked about how he met Jesus. And, and so this story is found in Acts chapter 26, verses 12 to 18. This is one of the times that Saul, who now has become Paul, instead of hating Christians and destroying them, he's starting churches. Instead of being a persecutor of the church, he's now being persecuted because he loves Jesus. And he's telling his story. He's actually, he's actually in prison, but he gets a chance to come out and kind of defend himself. And this is what he shares in Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> He says, on one of those journeys, he was going on journeys to destroy the church. On one of those journeys, I was going to a city of the city of Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. But about noon, King Agrippa, he's talking to this guy, King Agrippa, and he's telling his story to the king. And he says, but about noon, I was on the road and I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul... Why do you persecute me? He was working against Jesus. It is, hard for, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? Who is this voice that's speaking to me? This must, this must have just crushed his heart because he believed that Jesus was a lie. 
He had died. He hadn't risen. He was persecuting Christians. And then the voice says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Wow. (laughs) The Lord replied to him, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. And I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. First thing that Jesus says to Saul is, I'm Jesus, now you're going to spend your life telling people about me. Talk about, a, talk about a 180. Talk about having your life flip around. Persecuting the church, hating Christians, not believing in Jesus. He meets Jesus and his life changes. And in his story, and if you read it in the book of Acts, powerful story. He's a changed person. As passionately as he hated Christianity and as passionately as he persecuted the church, he now loved the faith and started new churches. It's an amazing story. And and I notice a couple things when when I look at Saul's story, Saul who became Paul. I notice that God shows up in surprising ways. And the three stories you're going to hear next aren't stories from Bible times. They're stories from modern times. People who are in this room right now that are going to share their story of how God showed up in some way and Jesus became more real and Christmas began to make more sense to them. Because just like the wise men have a story and the shepherds have a story and Saul has a story, here's the truth. If you've met Jesus, you have a story. And you have opportunities to tell your story. So so God shows up in amazing ways, and he does in our lives also. And then God loves rebels. God loves rebels. When somebody says, I'm not into this God thing, I'm not into this, maybe maybe you you got tricked in being here, and and somebody said, we're going to go out for breakfast, and they said, we're just going to stop by my church real quick on the way. And you're like... (laughs) Okay, great. Um, but you know, even, if you're just, you're, you know, even if you're here just because just your mom begged you and said, for your Christmas, my, your Christmas gifts this year, just come to church with me, whatever it is. God loves people who aren't yet believing in him and even pushing against him. Saul was having Christians killed, and God reached out to him and loved him. No matter where you are, you can't wander farther from where God can reach you and love you. He loves rebels. And then God has an amazing plan. The three stories you're going to hear in a moment are stories of people who've discovered that God has a plan for their life and they're seeking to live out that plan. And finally, I want you to be encouraged that for Saul, his story was powerful. And the three stories you're gonna hear right now are powerful stories. Not because these are powerful people. They're powerful stories because these people have met a powerful God, just like Saul did, just like the wise men did. And just like, just like you can, day after day after day. So you're going to hear three more stories. I'm going to get out of the way, and I'm going to let three people get up and share their stories. You're going to hear from a pastor. You're going to hear from a school teacher, author, mother, and wife of mine. I only have one of those. Uh, And you're going to hear from a doctor. And each of them is going to tell their story of how Jesus showed up and how their life has never been the same. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I pray for Keith and for Sherry and for Rick as they come and share their stories. And I pray for us that we will hear these stories, be encouraged by the stories, but also, Lord, that we would be inspired if we've met you, if we know you, if we love you. We'd be inspired to learn how to share our story because the world loves a story. And there's no story better than the power of Jesus. Open our hearts to receive and listen and learn to each of these stories because, Jesus, we still have a testimony if we've met you, a testimony of your presence and power and your goodness. So speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view that we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. Some of the earliest memories in my life are of me in church. I can recall back to when I was three, four, five years old and going to church and and watching the little, the teacher with her little flannel graph showing me little flannel Jesus and little flannel manger and 
It was a fun story. I remember throughout the week memorizing Bible verses so that on Sunday morning I could go back to church and I could show them what I'd remembered. I remember one Sunday in particular that I woke up sick. And my parents told me I couldn't go to church that morning. And I had a total meltdown. Like I was so upset that I couldn't be at church because I had memorized my verses that week and I wanted to be there. This continued until I was 14 years old. And when I was 14, I had the opportunity to deliver a sermon at my church. And I recall after that sermon that I had this thought. I think I could be a pastor when I grow up. Well, it wasn't long after having that thought and that experience that my life changed dramatically. And not in the way you think I'm going to share. I found myself for the next 12 years living a life that would not in any way be confused with a Christian life. I was so entrenched in the habits that this world said were good. I found myself abusing alcohol and a drug addict and living for myself in every way. In 1999, a friend of mine invited me to church. And it was interesting because I grew up in the church. It wasn't living a life that reflected a Christian faith. And my friend who invited me to church, he had never been in a church as a kid. And so I was moved. I thought, if, if he's going to church, I should give it a try. And so it was in 1999 that I actually got to know Jesus for who he was. He wasn't a little flannel character on Sunday school. He, he wasn't a, a historical figure that I was just hearing about. He wasn't someone who people just wrote stories about that I could memorize verses about. He was something completely different. And this, this verse in 2 Corinthians 5 sits so deeply inside me because, because Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You see, my life was a mess. I was doing all the wrong things. I, I had no hope. I had no peace. I had nothing to live for. But it was when I became aware of Jesus as my Savior, I became aware that God loved me so much that he sent his son to be born as an infant, grow up, live a perfect life, and ultimately die for my sins. I got to tell you, because you're here in a church today, I grew up in church, and I had no idea about this. I had no idea about what it meant to have a relationship with Jesus. Because you see, when I was 14 years old and I said, I think someday I might want to be a pastor, it wasn't because I had this grand vision of helping people walk their lives with Jesus. It wasn't because I wanted to see people develop a relationship with Jesus. You see, for me, church was about memorizing the verses. When I was 14 and I delivered a sermon, it was about giving a speech on a Sunday morning. But today, in 2016, now my life's about so much more. Jesus is the reason that I live. He's the purpose for all that I do. And I just know that this world needs him the way I needed him. And the truth is that when we come to know Jesus, we're completely transformed. And the old is gone. 
and the new has come. And this is who Jesus is to me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you transform lives. I thank you that you chose to do so with me. And Father, I know that so many others you've done the same with. But I also know that there's people here who need their lives transformed. Father, for those who have been going to church for a long time or may be here today for the first time, would you touch their lives? Would you touch their hearts? Would you make them aware of your love for them through Jesus and allow their lives to be forever transformed? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 John 3, 1. <clears throat> See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Through the grace of God, I knew that truth, that I was a child of God at a very young age. I grew up in a Christian home with a mom and a dad who loved Jesus, who lived it out in front of me, who brought me to church and Sunday school. I went to a church that I started Sunday school at three years old, and every week I would hear about Jesus' love for me. And it captured me at five years old. I was just a, a little girl. But on one particular Sunday, and I must have heard, I don't have a memory of actually hearing the gospel that morning, but it must have been shared in Sunday school. I was laying on the couch in my home. I still remember my mom was heating up chicken noodle soup. And I remembered having a quiet moment on the couch just with God and me, and just reflecting on how much Jesus loved me, that he would die for me on a cross. And in that moment... I asked Jesus into my heart. Th that was over 50 years ago. But I can honestly tell you that every single time I think of me on that couch, I can relive that sense of overwhelming joy just flooding my heart. And I remembered the response I gave back to God after receiving him in my heart. I told him, I said, I want to spend the rest of my life living for you. And I always say it's by God's grace because my heart for him um, was passionate already at a young age. And so early on, five, six, seven, eight, I still remember in seventh and eighth grade, and I, I never told anybody this because I thought it was kind of odd, but I wanted to marry a pastor. <laughs> Who wants to marry a pastor? <laughs> but I, you know where it came from? I watched my pastor's wife serve people. And she seemed to be in a unique position to serve them and have more opportunities. And that's why I wanted to be a pastor's wife, to be in a position where I could serve people and share this love of Jesus. But as time went on, this passion to show my love towards God, to serve people, I sort of lost sight of God's love just for me. But God would not let me go. This lavishing love, God had to speak a word into my life. And it came in, a, in an unlikely likely way for me. So Kevin and I, are, we're in our early 20s. We're at a conference. We're actually disappointed because the main speaker couldn't show up for some reason. And they had this guy coming. None of us had heard of him. His name was Brennan Manning. And um, so we're disappointed that Brennan Manning's speaking. But when he comes on the stage, there is a profound sense that Brennan Manning has a message. And we find out later through his life, through the 30 years that he continued to live after that, that he had a message to share about the relentless love of God. That was the mouthpiece for him to share this relentless love of God. So as he came on the stage and he began to share his story, he shared about another story about a priest named Edward Farrell. Edward Farrell lived in Detroit, Michigan. He had one living uncle who lived in Ireland, and he was going to be turning 80 years old. And so Edward Farrell flew to Ireland to spend this special day with his great uncle. On that morning, they woke up, 
They didn't speak a word to one another, and they drove to the shores of Lake Killarney. And as they were walking on the shores, um, it was about 20 minutes, not a word was spoken between either of them. And then all of a sudden, Uncle Seamus, out of nowhere, just starts to skip. And, he, and Edward looks at his uncle, and his face is beaming. He is smiling from ear to ear. And so Edward yells to his uncle as he's skipping away in this childlike manner, Uncle Seamus, you look really happy. He turns to him and he says, oh, I am, lad. Do you want to know why? Edward says, yes. And he stops and he says, you see, my father is fond of me. Miaba is fond of me. When Brennan told that story, something broke in me. I realized that I was fond of God, but I didn't know if God was fond of me. This was a level of lavishing love that God knew I had to get straight. That in all my effort to love him, to serve him, to serve people somewhere along the way, I had lost that he just loved me that I was a cherished and beloved daughter of God. That's the essence of the gospel. That joy that had captured me at five years old, that joy came when I just focused on God with me, Jesus coming down. That's when the joy came. That's when the joy still comes. When we get it right that the essence of the gospel is not us loving God but it's that he first loved us. And then in that love, we move, we serve, and we have joy. Christmas is a celebration of Emmanuel, God with us. God who is fond of us, who likes us, who loves us, and who, who has done everything so that he can be with us. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for such a great love. Oh God, and I, I lose sight of it so often, Lord. What seems to be for a good reason, Lord, that I'm so busy serving you and loving you, but oh God, we know the heart of the gospel is not what we do for you, but it's what you first done for us. And Lord, we are reminded again today on Christmas morning what you did when you sent your son Jesus here that you came down as a man, gave up your life for anyone who believes, Lord, that we can be with you today and for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. In uh, Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7, we read, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A little prequel before I tell you my story. Um, I don't know what everybody was doing this morning, but at 2 a.m. I was at the Family Birth Center at a community hospital waiting for, uh, uh, to assist a woman having a baby. And it was taking a bit longer than uh, expected. And uh, to say I was uh, a little impatient might be an understatement. It's like, obviously, it's Christmas morning, and I'd like to do my work and get home and get back to bed. And uh, so I'm sitting at the nurse's station, and um, God showed up, and he did it. This way, he said, uh, a nurse said, uh, hey, Dr. Alexander, I understand you're going to be speaking at Shoreline this morning. I kind of went, what? I am? No. And uh, there, there were six uh, nurses present at the nurse's station, and uh, they're the new nurses because the new nurses get to work the night shift, see? And uh, so, uh, so I said, oh, yeah, actually, I am. I said, would you like to hear my story? So I got an opportunity to share with them what I'm about to share with you. 
Um, my, my story really begins uh, in August of 1989. I had uh, been two years out of training from uh, my residency at USC. I'd come to Monterey with my lovely wife, uh, Veronica. We'd been married uh, two years, and um, we had our first child on the way, seven months pregnant, uh, Tess. And um, I'm in this beautiful place, two years into practice. Uh, my life could not be any better. In fact, it was perfect. Um, about a year before, I had accepted Christ and, uh, at one of the local churches. Shoreline wasn't here yet. And um, it was more of an intellectual choice. Um, being raised in, in, in science and um, medicine, um, I made a rational choice. It made sense to me. Uh, what I really couldn't get a grasp of, though, was this idea that you could have a personal relationship with God, with Jesus. Uh, that really just seemed a bit odd to me. Um, how, I thought, could you have a personal relationship with somebody that you couldn't see, you couldn't hear, you couldn't touch? Um, and uh, in terms of having a, a transformed life, um, I accepted the Lord, but I was pretty much the same person. So I talked to my friends that were believers, and um, you know, I was in a Bible study, I was reading through the Bible, I was praying, I was going to church, but nothing really changed in my life, and then I realized what I was missing. I needed a testimony, and I didn't have one, or at least I didn't think I did. So I began earnestly praying to God, to, to give me a testimony in which I could experience him in a tangible way, in a way that would alter my life, that would change me in a way that um, I would really become his child and I would understand what it meant to have Christ living within me and that I'm a vessel of the Holy Spirit. So fast forward a couple of months, I'm out on the tennis court playing tennis, and all of a sudden, wham, out of the blue, um, there's like a bomb went off in my head. I had this incredible headache, unlike anything I'd ever had before. I kept playing tennis and uh, not really paying attention to what the Lord was telling me. And um, the next thing I knew, I had lost vision in, the, in my right visual field, and followed by nausea and vomiting, and let alone just dizzy and all the other stuff, and I couldn't continue playing, and I, uh, like a good doctor, got my stuff together and drove myself home. <laughs> and uh, not the first of many mistakes I've made in my life, but um, made it home, uh, went to bed, uh, my wife was quite concerned about me. I was not concerned about me because I was healthy and young, and at 34 years of age, nothing could be wrong with me. Um, two days later, my wife convinced me to go up to the uh, community hospital. I had an MRI scan and a CT scan. I still remember uh, very vividly the radiologist coming in and said, you've got a big problem. You have uh, an aneurysm in your head that's as big as a golf ball and it's really deep. Um, I had, it had a particular name, it was called an AVM, arterious venous malformation, which is really, really bad news. And I knew that my life was over. Because you see, I'd taken care of patients like that two years prior, and they had all died. And this was really, really, really bad. Um, I remember that night, I got down on my hands and knees and I prayed to God, please take away this fear because I was terrified. I was terrified because I knew I was going to die. I had a wife with a baby. And I didn't know what to do. 
And I said, I, I want you to take away this fear, Lord, because I can't handle it. I don't know what to do. And I just ask you to take care of my family. Other than that, I'm yours. That's it. Well, I went to bed that night, and when I woke up the next day, something, it was the strangest thing. It, it absolutely was supernatural. I wasn't worried about a thing. I didn't know what was going to happen. I cared, but there was no fear. I was absolutely calm. Uh, and a uh, short time later, fast forward again, uh, I'm at uh, UC San Francisco. I met a wonderful surgeon and neuroradiologist who said, hey, listen, you know, there's been a lot of changes since you graduated two years ago. We now are able to go in and take out this AVM. It's not easy. Uh, we have to do some special things, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think you could, you could make it. You might make it. Well, I didn't really have a choice. If I didn't have the operation, I was going to die. That was very clear. Um, so... Through the grace of God, I had seven hours of neurosurgery and two blood transfusions, and I sort of became aware of my surroundings and woke up uh, after two days in the intensive care unit, and all of a sudden, I was faced with a very unusual reality, and that is um, I wasn't a vegetable because I was awake but I had no ability to read, to write, to process any information. I could speak, but I had no ability to lay down any current memories, and I had no future. It's the hardest thing to explain. Most of what I remember, I don't really remember. I've been told what happened. Uh, because I could remember the past, but I couldn't remember the present or the future. Um, it's like your computer's on, but you can't access any of the programs. Well, I remained in this state for like um, six days, and honestly, I had planned to read my Bible, talk to my doctors, pray, visit with friends. None of that were, was happening. All I could do was say this. And I, rem I do remember this. And it was just, Jesus, help. Help. And that's all I could do. Well, I laid in that bed, all hooked up to all kinds of monitors for six days. And then the night of the sixth day, um, on the 11 o'clock news, there was a story, an amazing story. And it was about this guy, this baseball player named Dave Dravecki. And, and he had had cancer. If you don't know the story, he had cancer in his pitching arm. They had to completely tear out his whole muscular system in his arm and rebuild it to pull its cancer out. And he was never going to pitch again, except that he was a strong Christian. He believed in the Lord's ability to heal. And he recovered. And he had pitched his first game back at Giant Stadium, and he had won the game. And the 11 o'clock news was telling this story. And as I processed this story, I'll never forget, because he said, the, the, the news reporter said, well, how do you explain this miracle? And he said, I explain the miracle because I've been saved and healed by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when I heard that, something very unusual happened. I can only tell you that it was like having a seizure, except I didn't lose consciousness. Um, another way I describe it is like an electric shock, like you put your hand in a, in, in, a, in a socket. But immediately, my brain just got rebooted. And I actually, I knew that story. I knew what they were talking about. I understood that Jesus Christ, the Lord of the universe, can heal people with his touch. And I felt that I had actually encountered God in a very tangible, real way, and he healed me. Well, the next morning, I was super excited because I had to read the paper because I needed to 
I needed confirmation that what I had experienced the night before actually happened. And I grabbed the paper and I, I, I could read. It was just the most profound experience that I've ever had. And I sat down in my bed at that time and I, I asked forgiveness and I said, Jesus, I said, you know, I have been selfish and I have lived the first 34 years of my life for me. And I don't want to do that anymore. And I want to devote the rest of my life to serving you. And through my faith and my family in this church, hopefully I've been doing that and I plan to for the rest of my life. And that's my story. Lord, uh, you do show up, Lord, in, in, in amazing, mysterious ways, Lord, and I thank you so much that you pursued me to the bitter end, to the time at which I was on my knees without my brain to think, without any help at all, and you came into my life and you showed me in a tangible way your son Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I, I just thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for the people in this church, in this uh, community and beyond that you've touched, Lord. And I, I pray, Lord, that you give them boldness to tell their stories, Lord. To tell their stories in a passionate, meaningful way so other people, Lord, that don't know your son, Jesus, will come to know him as well. I thank you for this Christmas season. I thank you for this time. I praise you and thank you again in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Such powerful stories. Can we give them a...